Welcome to the 2016 annual dinner as we proudly present Jenny Rometty, Chairman, President, and CEO of IBM, in conversation with Pramod Hawk, Senior Managing Partner at Norwest Venture Partners. Jenny and Pramod will exchange views tonight on a range of topics from cognitive computing to business transformation to other things that they see as very important for future innovation and economic growth. After their discussion, they will have a few moments to take questions from the audience. We would wish to thank IBM for their partnership in making this event possible. Let's just give them a hand. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club so that everybody can follow along. And there are other Twitter codes uh, in your bulletins. So our conversation leader, Pramod Hawk, is a major force in the venture capital industry, having invested in more than 70 companies over 25 years with over 40 billion in exit values over that time. Early in his career, after earning a PhD and an MBA, he went to work for a large company called EMI Medical, which was a pioneer. They actually pioneered the CAT scan or CT scan. And then after that, he put in time at a few startups, and uh, including stints as COO and CEO. And I would say that time gave him a very special amount of insight into what small companies and startups face having walked in those shoes himself at that time. And although they attended at different times, Jenny and Pramod are both, uh, they both went to Northwestern University in Illinois. <laughs> and the two first met before Jenny took the helm as CEO, and Pramod has followed her journey since that time. Please welcome Jenny Rometty and Pramod Hawk. Thank you, Ramon. Although I, I very much appreciate that you pointed out we were at Northwestern at different times. Okay? <laughs> All right. That wasn't of the same year, different years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, it's our, it's our pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. And we look forward to, uh, you know, an interesting evening here as we uh, talk about, uh, you know, some interesting. Uh, things that are transpiring in the tech industry and uh, you know new kinds of innovations that are happening and it's my pleasure to uh, uh, you know be in conversation with uh, Ginny Rometty here. Um, Ginny as you know uh, you know has uh, had a great career uh, and accomplished a lot of fascinating things at IBM and in fact uh, you know I was looking at uh, uh, your bio a little bit you started in 1981 Thanks for a, pointing that a, out. As a systems engineer. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting off on a good foot. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, close to 35 years at it IBM. Was, it was just and 35 last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what a, what a remarkable career and, you know, all the things that Ginny's been able to accomplish uh, and, uh, you know, just fascinating. And so, uh, you know, appointed CEO in uh, uh, January of 2012, wow. correct? Yeah. Yes. And so uh, prior to that, Ginny was uh, responsible as, uh, uh, you know, the group executive for all of sales and marketing and strategy. Yeah. And I think I, I met you at that time. Yeah. Uh, I think there was some event that was happening in New York and uh, you and I ran into each other and began to talk about... Uh, Might have been our centennial. I think that's probably years. what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so a lot of uh, fascinating things that Ginny's been involved with, and then uh, especially since being CEO, uh, you know, uh, sort of a pioneer, so to speak, in this whole area of cognitive computing, and you know, utilizing the IBM Watson uh, uh, program and and technology uh, to uh, apply it to a lot of different verticals, uh, and also. Uh, you know, able to sort of really do some fascinating things in the area of security as well as uh, transformation of businesses and a whole host of other things that we're going to talk about. So, uh, Ginny, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, 
to be in conversation with you here. Thank you, Pramod. And, uh, and yeah. it's nice, it, Pramod just landed from India a few, yeah. a few minutes ago or so, right? Uh, about, about a couple of hours ago, okay, I was at a board meeting. <laughs> couple, Close. A couple of board meetings, and in fact, one of the companies that's involved in artificial intelligence and the use of that in operational analytics. Yeah, I so. didn't know if I needed to have my <laughs> shopping cart out as he was telling me about these companies, so, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so, uh, you know, Ginny, you've been, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, stuff in the area of uh, cognitive computing, and I know that, uh, you know, as uh, the street says, you bet the company uh, or the future of the company going forward on Watson and on cognitive computing uh, in particular. And so it'd be interesting to, you know, get your perspectives on how you see that impacting society, the use of cognitive computing. Yeah. Um, I first should probably give it a little bit of context. I think that would um, be great. I mean, when you said it, it is a big bet, but it is not a risky bet. That's uh, correct. And this goes back, oh boy, we probably started almost two decades ago on this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something everybody would identify with, because as we got going down this path, and I don't even think of it as a product, I'll come to that, uh, it was a time when we said, look, we look out and we see a world where there's going to be all this data and whether it's, at that time it wasn't tweeting, but it could have been sensors, it was images, it was gonna just grow and grow and grow. And we had a lot of discussion over, you know what, the systems of today can't deal with it, A, but more <coughs> important, and this is where the word cognitive came from, um, it, you'd have cognitive overload. People won't be able to deal with all of this. So we'll come back. This is a pretty important sort of deep root in our belief about where the technology is and what's going to happen with it. And so it would be this cognitive overload. You'd have to develop something that you would never program. These would have to be systems that could understand, reason, and learn from all of this and, con and come up with mm. some of their own answers. And they would learn over time, you know, which I always say, this is the one technology that'll be worth more in time than less in time, right? So that'll be the first. And so it would be not a product. We always thought it would be an era, an era. And so that work kind of went up until the time we did Jeopardy, which some people might be familiar when we had Watson do Jeopardy, which it only did. And Watson was our manifestation of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a belief that it wouldn't be just IBM. I mean, this would be an era mm -hmm. that you would have these systems because you'd have no choice to deal with all this data. And probably more important, it was to solve some of the really tough problems. And that's what you asked me. That's why I said a little bit of context. Sure. You know, you'd have to be able to solve things, you need this technology to solve it. So that brings us sort of today, and it is why one of the very first things we started on was healthcare, which is we undoubtedly picked one of the most difficult areas, but I absolutely believe the time is right. And I, I, Promote, I did not realize that you worked for a healthcare company back in time. Oh, I did, I, oh, that's where I started. Yeah, so now I know why you're always asking me about this, okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, now, now this all made sense, yes. So, healthcare, so, but I must say, and I just noticed it on the programs, uh, I think on the front, I really have a deep belief that if it's digital today, it will be cognitive tomorrow. It will be, ever, it will be pervasive. So you become a cognitive business, mm -hmm. and it is a technology era. So we can talk about it. I, going through all the processes of IBM and where we apply this and how we change what we do. So we'll come back around. But to change society, to end your question, this is we will. With these technologies, I have not a doubt in my mind that we're going to be able to impact things like healthcare, the mm -hmm. environment, and actually jobs. I mean, we can mm -hmm. talk more about that. And you just go through the whole list, and I actually think it'll be an era of man and machine. And I'm a, the, another reason we call it cognitive, AI has got some sometimes negative baggage associated with it. And we think of it as augmenting intelligence. And I, I really, given all our experience and what we've seen, Actually, we did a bit of a count now. We're at a couple hundred million consumers are being touched by Watson, going to a billion by the end of next year. And it is a very two-way relationship. So that's what I think we, I am very optimistic about this, mm -hmm. and for good reason. That's great. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> talk about uh, AI and machine learning, and you know, a lot of uh, companies that we see from time to time uh, that you know, are touting uh, you know, AI is, is the platform that they're building and so on. Um, and then you also see, you know, some of the larger companies, you know, talking about it. So how is, uh, you know, Watson's approach and IBM's approach uh, in cognitive computing different from, you know, what uh, 
Microsoft might be doing or, or what Alphabet might be doing? Um, well, look, there's no doubt, I think, if we go back in time, even when Jeopardy sort of unleashed again, AI's been around for decades. And um, I think it, at one time I was an artificial intelligence, I mean, I don't think I was an artificial intelligence specialist in my, <laughs> in my early, early <clears throat> career years. Um, we called it that. And I can even remember when we'd go to parties and my husband, he does not work for IBM, you know, he'd say, well, what should I say I am? And I said, well, just say you're an AI specialist. No one knows what it is. <laughs> and he would say, I'm an AI specialist. This one, this is probably 30 years ago. And so um, you fast forward to, so today, and people, some people call it the AI winter coming out, right? You've got everybody talking about, because everybody sees the same problem, all this data, how to make something out of it. So everyone's approached it. And I believe as a company, so, so if I kind of fast forward to today, every client, and I get the privilege of seeing so many, but if they think about what's gonna be their competitive differentiation, and I'll come to, to us in a minute, but every one of you, they'll say it's data. And you know it'll be the basis of their competitive advantage in some way. Mm -hmm. And so, what we looked at that and said, so what would be, and where do we separate from? I think some of the others out there. And I would say we separate in three ways. One is this point about it, the goal being augmenting what man does. This is about helping you <coughs> do your best, or it is about taking care of things so you can do what you mean are meant to do which I think we saw fascinating learning through how the doctors, so we're now touching probably 200 million patients. And so we're watching how the doctors have interacted with this technology, which you would have originally, I mean, any of you, anybody ever worked with bringing technology to doctors? Have you ever, is it a always work? <laughs> no, it's difficult. I mean, because they, they've like, I've got all these patients to see, I get X number of minutes, I can't change the way I do my work, it's got to go like this, somebody else has to do that. I'm very empathetic. And they're, they're coming into a world where, you know, some estimates now where medical data will double every 75 days. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? I mean, that is impossible. And so, um, but what I watch, so I, we've been through many runs on this in history technology comes in, they're like, I can't change what I do. I don't have time for it. I can't do this. But what we watched and said with this technology was almost like a collegial relationship That's between right. man or woman and this. And that, I think, has really shown us. And this, I've watched it now with lawyers, with doctors, with underwriters, with engineers. It's the same. Or beginning call center people, the same kind of thing. And so what differs is this goal, and I think that's what this era will do. It will be man and machine. These are not machines that if you just dumped a bunch of data on them, that they would say, ah, I'm a doctor now. They have to learn, and you have to teach them, like as we say, as a child would start. You, this, these are related, no, these are not, and then they learn over time and keep going. So the first is the goal, man and machine, is where we differ with others, I think. It's this goal that we are augmenting what each of us does uh, in our life. The second is probably the biggest business thing that differentiates us from others. And we, I have to tell you, it took us some time to get this right. So if you really believe data is your basis of competitive advantage in your businesses, how can I be sure that the insights <coughs> that you have belong to you and not someone else? Mm -hmm. So how we've architected, it's a cloud system, but how we've architected it is such that, um, by the way, your most valuable data, everybody has access to what's public the most valuable data is gonna be marrying that with what I call not legacy data. This is like your accumulated knowledge in your business. And so therefore, I think you're gonna see this resurgence of all these established companies mm -hmm. that take advantage of this. So if I'm a company, I bring my data, my analytics, we bring Watson and our data, which we do bring a lot of data, and, but the insights, we can guarantee the insights go to you and they don't train this data for somebody else to use. Now, part of why that is, is I don't have a search legacy background, okay? So some companies, they grew up as search. Search is about a big pool of data that's a knowledge database. That's not what this is. And I think it's an important business model difference. Every client I know says, you know what? I've seen this movie before, and I actually know how it ends. If that's not a good ending if, if I train the data with mine for somebody else to use it. And so I want the value of all that accumulated years of my data. So our second big thing, not, I, I, I do think this is, as you all think through your business models and what decisions you make and how you do it, knowing who owns the data and who owns the insights is a really big point uh, and where you do go with this. And then the third one is, um, I also think we're all in an era now that so much of this is about an ecosystem. 
That's correct. So a big open ecosystem. And um, we had some fun this morning. We did um, a developer conference. Um, I can't even remember where I was. It was somewhere not too far away. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Innovation Hangar, does that ring a bell to anyone? Is, is that a place, or did I make up that name? Is that a, I, I, I'm thinking I was at an Innovation Hangar. OK. And so, um, but we had, I don't know, 1,500 developers there. And you know, an open ecosystem says you make something consumable, you know, ubiquitous on the cloud. All, we broke Watson up into all these pieces so they can digest it in good ways. And uh, I met a bunch of people who built things that I had not seen Sorry, before. Yeah. Of course, I mean, you don't have control then in an open ecosystem like that. And um, so one of them, if I can just tell a quick funny story on it, one was a young man, 19 years old at Stanford here, uh, and he built something called Do Not Pay. <clears throat> um, and Okay, so I said, well, what does do not pay do? And he said, well, using Watson, uh, it is, he goes, it's a form of a robo lawyer. He said, um, you know, when I came to the United States, he's from the UK, I had to get a driver's license and I kept getting parking tickets. And my parents called and said they would quit paying for these parking tickets. And he said, so I had to figure out what to do about this. And so I, I'm thinking to myself, well, like, don't park where you're getting the parking tickets. <laughs> and uh, as, a, as a, you know, I'm sure what the parents said. And he said, so instead, though, I came up with this thing that I have put together the cognitive intelligence on how to fight these parking tickets. <laughs> and he, it's now gone viral. He's got, I think he said, um, 250,000, uh, I amazing. guess, customers. <laughs> and uh, he's, his hit, hit rate is 50% on winning, fighting on these parking <laughs> tickets. And he asks you a few simple questions to build your case. And it spills out your loyal, legal document and how you and it automatically submits it and how you fight your ticket. And uh, he started with parking tickets, and he has now moved on to fire your landlord, and uh, he's got a whole <laughs> set of these things. And, and, and so I'm like, okay, now these are all legal, correct, in what you're doing? And uh, yeah, I said, this is because you believe you did not park illegally. So, um, but this is the kind of thing that uh, it's just it's great imagination, yeah. a young kid, and, uh, but now he's working it, he's got another whole big group around refugee matching, refugees and how to have them get, um, uh, legal documentation and all. Uh, so I thought it was an excellent, yeah. great example. So that leads me to my third question on that. So, you know, you, you talked about, you know, this entrepreneur using Watson uh, pieces of it. So, you know, as you look at the platform Watson, um, cognitive computing platform, how can uh, startups um, utilize, you know, some of the capabilities of Watson and then actually build apps and other kinds of applications and so on or solutions. Well, look, I, I actually think I, I want to. I'm going to answer it in a broader context too, because everyone. I don't mean this is not a commercial on Watson or anything. So <clears throat> subliminal, maybe, but not. Uh, didn't mean it that way. Um, but because I think everybody in, in your own businesses here, you're thinking about how do you form an ecosystem. This is true whether you're a bank, right? It's true. Um, you can embrace fintech, you can fight fintech. Mm -hmm. um, and I think every, many people are choosing to embrace in a good way. Mm -hmm. So everybody's got this point of view of some kind of platform, that it, whether that's micro level or big to build. And if you're gonna build a platform, I think you gotta do a couple things. One is you gotta give them access to something they can't get access to anywhere else. So in our case, we would be the science of Watson, the science of the cloud. I mean, we're investing Last 12 months, we, we invested, or, or even the first last nine months, I think $12 billion. So <coughs> it's a big number. Wow. You can't get it elsewhere. So that's one is you give them access to science. I think the second thing you have to do for any kind of a platform here is you got to help people be better than they would be than not working with you. So we're offering them all sorts of uh, ways to certify as a, a cognitive developer. Uh, Udacity, Top Coder, you would know some of these things are all, you can get a nano degree in it, so mm -hmm. some new concepts all out there in this. And then third is help make them commercially successful. That's true. Right? And that's what people want on these. Mm -hmm. And in our case, part of making them commercially successful is we've got the world's largest services company and they bring hundreds of partners out as part of solutions. And so channels are what most people are looking mm -hmm. for, for their, whatever their innovation is. So I think those rules kind of fit anybody. Sure on how to uh, help a startup. Good. No, I think we'll In bite-sized chunks, yeah. right? Yeah, and of course free. That would be the other thing they all want, is free. Yeah. yeah. For, for some period of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you grow up. Any other thoughts on? Uh, on startups? Yeah. No, or, I, I, or, or the whole, uh, you know, cognitive computing stuff? Um, the, <clears> the, only, <throat> the only other point I would make is um, this point about being able to solve 
problems that I don't think we could solve today. I mean, they'll span between basic every day, because I do believe every decision you make in the next five years, in personal or really big, you're going to be assisted by some kind of this technology. That's right. Yeah, I believe for all of us that's going to be true. And so I look at some of the basic stuff where, you know, we're doing work on uh, right now with Sesame Street and with the United States uh, Teachers Association, the first ro wave is rolling out of lesson plans for kids. So on the everyday side, so I don't know if you've ever like looked in a search engine for third grade math lessons. Anybody have a third grader? Anybody even remember third grade math? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, it, and so I, I did it just for, for kicks to see what you get. Oh my God, it's, um, it's atrocious. It's a lot of stuff. It is yeah. atrocious. Yeah. You would never know how to match a learning plan to how this kid learns, or even if it was a good plan. Yeah. So we'd been, the first thing we set Watson off on was uh, third grade math. We started with third grade math. And um, it is to match your child's learning style to the lesson, the right lessons plans. Interesting. So it's yeah. rolling to 500 teachers. Yeah. It'll go to all teachers by next year. Yeah. And then we keep moving into all these other subjects. So you'll feel it on this every day. To the other side, um, I would just say this point on healthcare. I really, we will humbly do our little piece, I believe, to change the face of healthcare now. Anybody in healthcare other than promote, we have uh, two, three, four of us, well, I, I mean, think that's five. A, I think the timing I, is I think is it's right. a huge vertical when you think about, you know, 20% or close to 20% of our GDP spent on healthcare, you know. Well, three trillion dollars. I, I tell a year you, we, and a you lot know, of wastage. Wow, that's it, the waste yeah. in yeah. the efficiency, but it's the outcomes. I mean, that's right. Exactly. Um, Sixty Minutes did a, quick se did a segment on Watson about three weeks ago, and unbeknownst to us, had gone out and interviewed uh, different uh, hospitals and the like, and it was for genomic sequencing. And it's a you know for us, it's an amazing segment. Uh, the doctor says, look. And back to how doctors work with, will work with, or professionals, any professional yeah. work with technology. <clears throat> he said, we ran through the genomic sequencing, and guess what? Thousand cases, patients. Watson came up with exactly what my doctors did at the tumor board. So if you know much about complex uh, cancer cases, when they get to a certain stage and you do your genomic sequencing, and they meet at a tumor board, and they discuss what your possible yeah. treatments are. And he said, but in 30%, we found more. Sure. And yeah. that was the ability to match. And so, you know, we're now treating more patients outside the U.S. than in for Oncology Advisor. Mayo Clinic does all of their breast cancer clinical trial matching now with Watson. And we just announced with Quest, who has access to 50% of the doctors, 70% of all cancer cases in this country, if you want genomic sequencing yeah. done, it will be done. So. This is really moving quick. So oh, I think so. I think I there's am, lots, so lots of innovation going on in that space. Yeah. I, and both for cost and as yeah. well as, yeah. as we're uh, seeing outcome. That, you know, in the venture community, we're seeing you know, lots of startups in this AI space, machine intelligence, machine learning space. Cognitive computing, as you would, you know. But you do need you do need data. I mean, no, it, you're, and you're, you're right. And, and and you know, when you think about it, not you know, just publicly available. No, data. no, no. It's it's all kinds of data. When you look at, you know, we are in you know, what people call the digital economy, right? And one of the things to talk about in the digital economy is that data is the currency. Yep. Right? When you think about it, data is the currency in the digital economy. Now, how you put that data to work is what's going to differentiate companies going forward, right? I mean, you could have, you know, it's just like, you know, you got currency sitting there and you could invest it in a CD and uh, maybe make 0.3%, or you could find intelligent ways to invest that money, right? Yeah. Same thing, you know, you get data, but if a company doesn't know how to utilize the data that it has to its advantage, and that is where cognitive computing comes in. Well, I think when you and I first met, I just, it's something worth thinking about. I sort of coined this phrase that data would be the next, the world's next natural resource. That's correct, exactly. So, yeah. But the part to me that- <clears throat> If you use it correctly. <laughs> not only if you use it correctly, but I think if you just think of other natural resources, the value does not necessarily go to who owns them. And this is why you have to think this through. If you think about oil or you know, go to Africa and every country and all the raw material, ah, but who refined it is who got the value. I mean, right. there are really poor countries that have all these rich natural resources. And right. so I think it's gonna be the same thing as true with companies. That's very true. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, blockchain. Oh, one of my right? favorite topics. And topic. I know you're, uh, you've done a lot of work in that space, and I know that IBM is, is pioneering a lot of work in this whole area of blockchain. So uh, maybe, you know, if you could take just a few minutes who, and tell who, us. Who does anyone about. know blockchain? 
Oh, excellent. Yeah. I have an <laughs> audience of experts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, put your hands back up. Cause, and then keep them up <laughs> if you believe it'll have a big impact. Uh, uh, Oh, more went up even. Yeah. Okay, so, so how that's think, even better. How, how do you think it's going to impact business? What, I, are, what are the verticals, and how exactly will those verticals well, benefit? I can see it. Well, I have a bunch of agreeers in here, too. <laughs> so this is, um, I, they'll probably add something to this conversation. But this, to me, is another one of those kind of, I can remember, i got to tell you a funny story about it. It goes back, I can't remember how many years ago. I'm in my office one night, or at my home office. And um, this would have been, I guess, at the, the beginning about um, all of the uh, cryptocurrencies and you know Bitcoin, so very early on in Bitcoin, and um, all the chatter about it, and so I'm sitting and so I start just looking around. To I'm going to learn more about it, so I'm just looking, doing my own research online, and I stumble upon this YouTube video. So I'm watching this YouTube, and it's in it, in, and I must say it goes on for about 20 minutes, but it's very interesting, flipboard accurate, describing how it's not Bitcoin, but how blockchain, the underlying technology, works under it. So, but it is a little lengthy, I must say that. But I do watch the whole thing. Gets to the end, is some IBMer, okay? So mm -hmm. it apparently worked for me. I didn't know that. So I'm like, uh, excellent. Okay, I'm like, we're well, gonna shorten that up. Anyway, so I, I, uh, I saw that, but it was right. I mean, and so this is my beginning of my love affair with, uh, with blockchain, blockchain, in our love affair with it. And I really believe for any supply chain, any supply chain, mm -hmm. um, where there's inefficiency, which is about every supply chain there is, uh, any amount of paper, uncertainty, you will apply, that is the simplest, you will apply blockchain. And this idea of a distributed ledger that is immutable and that you can know that when one link's attached to the next, that is permanent, can't be changed, and goes on, but it's distributed like mm -hmm. this. So you could, you could have a, I, I and we have been as bold to say that blockchain will do for trusted transactions what the internet did for information. Mm -hmm. And I did this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that was yesterday, and I said, you know, if you knew today what you knew about the internet in 1995, what would you do differently? And I think you should ask yourself that question on blockchain. That's so I, I see it with, um, I can't remember, we have several hundred POCs going on with clients mm -hmm. on this. And, but here was my, my almost thing that convinced me more. In my own company, um, I must have dozens of blockchain projects going on, and I do not have to force anyone to do any of them. Mm -hmm. So that is always a signal. And so they have embraced it, and we have a big financing business. So we probably do 40 billion of financing a year. And they took a simple process, disputes on invoices for financing. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be, this was not Singapore, this was in this other country, the wrong tax rate, whatever it is, and you got capital tied <coughs> up in it. And so um, they put our ledger up of our whole financing business, pretty fast up on blockchain, and the disputes go to virtually, friction goes to about nothing on these disputes. Mm -hmm. And so now take that and pretend you are the world's largest shipper, and we're talking about the flow of goods out of a country in Africa and all the different places that you go, and you, you are talking huge amounts of efficiencies and savings. Wow, Sorry. so I would, I would add so, so, one other thing though you gotta have, yeah. this would be the difference. We must, I, I gotta put a plug in here for open source in this case. Mm -hmm. um, you are gonna have to have sort of a foundation that everybody uses that is trusted, the same one. Or you're gonna get up with islands and you will never get these benefits. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Hyperledger project is the fastest growing uh, open source right. project yeah. out mm -hmm. there. And we've built, uh, we've contributed to it and uh, it is the fastest growing open source projects the Linux Foundation has ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I think is important, be the foundation. Mm -hmm. So there will be both the private Blockchains as well as the oh, it doesn't as matter. Well as the public, yeah. Does, so, it, because governments are going to want, it's got to have a permission, and governments are going to want to have some visibility. That's correct. Yeah. Central banks will, or you yeah. won't do serious business right. over this. So who do you think are, you know, which vertical do you think will be the, the early adopter of blockchain? What are you finding based on what you see? Um, well, I think the supply chain of shipping, yeah. anything, trade logistics, uh, yeah. trade logistics big yeah. time, yeah. but we have many in the banks. Because, I was going to ask you, yeah, the financial many, services yeah, industry. Like yeah, like Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, you know, MUFG. Mm -hmm. These guys are any kind of contract between two parties mm -hmm. that they can make a smart contract. There's a lot of that. So trade finance, that. But you could do it for, um, I've got some, 
proof of concept and compliance. Mm -hmm. Anything you have to have a, a record, any kind of transaction that crosses parties today. So I think you'll see it first, trade finance, you'll see it in financial institutions. In, in, yeah. for, Especially yep, in the payment industry in over payment a period industry of time. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. And then governance, risk, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's Do you have any on. companies in blockchain? Yeah. No, you know, from, from a venture perspective, we just think that it's a little too early for us. And you could be a little too late. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think the sense is, in fact, you know, some of the Gartner reports indicate that, you know, it'll probably be another four or five years before it really takes off. And so, I, I, know, I, I, so uh, I, we'll see. Okay. We'll see how that you, go, you keep yeah, doing your yeah. thing. I'll do my thing. That's good. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. no, I, I really believe this is one. It, part of it is because it isn't difficult. It isn't that difficult to implement. In, in yeah. alongside your current yeah. systems, you can do it. So, I, I, you know, we just did a big one, a big announcement with Walmart, and it's for food safety. So uh, we and Walmart right, yeah. are doing food safety with blockchain uh, in China on pork, where huh. they'd had some issues, and that's what uh, sure. this is about. And it'll be going here pretty soon. So that's interesting. All right, let's talk about security, cybersecurity. You mm, know, I know it's a good. huge investment area. You know, for uh, corporations, enterprises. You know, for venture f companies, venture funds, funds like ourselves. I don't know, even you know, corporations like yourselves have spent a lot of money on. Uh, Cybersecurity and so on. So, uh, how do you see, um, you know, how do you see that landscape? How do you see cognitive computing impacting yeah. some Look, of that? I, I, um, how many of you spend time on the topic of cyber? Every, almost everybody that runs a company, right? <clears throat> I mean, because I do it from running our company uh, right. perspective, right? And um, you know, obviously, doesn't matter it, 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 every day because a bad guy gets smarter, right? So we're all doing something. To us, it's a business as well. So we are now the largest enterprise security company out there. And, um, but the secret of it, I think, you're probably not gonna be surprised. I think you're living, this is a world so complex on this topic, you have to assume whatever you do, the bad guy is in already. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the answer is gonna be related to, you won't be surprised, some sort of massive real-time analytics that you're constantly looking for something that is just slightly astray. Um, whether that's in data, in a flow, in relationships, in behavior, in you know, trade surveillance, whatever it is. And so the future is going to be, one, you could put a cloud in. Clouds are actually, because they're more standard, they're going to be more secure. Um, we needed in this country, and we did get legislation, still has to get through the Senate, uh, to have sharing of information is another mm -hmm. way to fight mm -hmm. this issue because exactly, the yeah. good guys have to band together to fight the bad guys. That's right. so, um, <clears throat> but you have to be able to, if you're a company, if you share, you have to be able to do it knowing you're not going to be liable. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to be able to do it without um, a penalty. Mm -hmm. And so um, our government, there was, through the House of Representatives, some very good legislation on information sharing now needs to get through Senate. Uh, hopefully, I'm hopeful maybe it does before the year is, mm. before the Congress goes out. And so that is kind of the second part, this collaboration piece. But the third piece is this part that all of us, I think, in my best analogy is to think of it like an immune system, is how security will run. So all of us have germs in our body, and what does your immune system do? If your germs act up, immune system goes to try to, you know, quarten it off so that it doesn't get spread to any other part of your body if you get a you know some sort of infection and that's pretty much how you've got to run it inside of a company and across really, yeah. right mm -hmm. so that you're constantly looking you find something you wall it off so it doesn't infect everything else and then this goes to the next level and i think it is a fantastic analogy because that's why the cdc and the who got c created for health because mm -hmm. what does the center for disease control do or the world health organization center for disease control says hey if there's an outbreak in one place I won't um, be able to quick do that. distribute mm -hmm. information stop it so it doesn't get to the other countries and doesn't mm -hmm. it's like no different as a cyber attack okay yeah. it's one here we got to stop it we don't want it in yeah. all the banks we don't want it and we've got to follow that kind of work. Which, totally agree. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so therefore, I think you're going to continue to see companies pop up. We do it. We have Watson for Cybersecurity. I think goes live uh, first quarter, mm -hmm. and you can't you can't find enough professionals in your company. Forget mm -hmm. that part of it. So you've got to. I think there's something like eighty thousand security blogs a month written. I mean, really. You, yeah, you're, no, I know. you know, yeah. who's going to deal? And then to be able to know which even apply to you. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing I think is the future for security. No, and I so agree. if you're investing, investing in companies that are all like we are all around. It, by the way, 
that was our approach too. We aren't going to do everything. We put a foundation in so people can write stuff uh, using our data. Sure. No, no, we, you know, we, we as a firm, Norwest, including myself personally, you know, we've been very involved in those whole cybersecurity space for many years. You know, we have close to about 15 active companies in the space today. And, you know, I think that is where we see, um, you know, machine intelligence, artificial learning, artificial, you know, intelligence and so on coming in. And really but, but promote, I do think the hard part's going to be, part of the problem with it is the average client has 80 products from 40 vendors. That's right. That is a problem. I yeah, mean, that, yeah. like, someone no, said no, to I me, agree, I agree. that's like putting a different alarm company on every door in your that's house. Right, that's you right. Know, and you're like, and, okay, now what happens? One yeah, open. And, and I think it's worse than that because, see, what you, what you have is when you look at this whole cyberspace, uh, you know, you've got the, the threat actors on the one end. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously you've got people that are trying to defend and it's an arms race because the threat actors are well-funded, state-sponsored and well-funded in other ways. And so literally they're not sitting there, you know, there's oh. always new innovation going on. And in fact, one of the things that we're seeing is that the conventional means of cybersecurity in the past, things like, you know, well, antivirus detection mm -hmm. and incident response, but then even some of the newer stuff that came out, uh, you know, where you've got sandboxes, right? And you, uh, you sort of uh, uh, put some of the traffic into the sandbox and see what goes on. But what's happened is that threat actors have figured out how sandboxes work. And so they have figured out a way to evade sandboxes. And so you've got malware that's sitting there, totally bypasses sandboxes, and then eventually, you know, with a certain amount of latency, it got, goes and does all kinds of havoc. And then the amount of information, as you pointed out, you know, you, the signatures that are created today, uh, thousands and thousands of signatures. And see, that is where cognitive computing comes yeah. in, a fascinating yeah. way. Th this is you why learn from it, it keeps learning, and it keeps adapting, and it figures out what is going on, and it provides a whole bunch of insights. Uh, and I think that is, and then it augments, you know, the security experts that are sitting there. That's right. Because you don't eliminate them but you give them the ability, because it's so hard otherwise, to look at, oh my goodness, I've got these thousand uh, uh, blogs or thousand incidents that happen, how do I sort of make sense out of all of that? Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the ability to use machine learning to be able to draw some insights out of that and keep learning. Yeah, this is why you can't, this is another reason why um, you can't over-regulate this area. That's correct. Yeah. If, if I've always, you know, as we have been participating and tried to get healthy regulation here, if you over-regulate, we'll be so busy like filling out regulation forms, the bad guy's That's like, right. great, I know what you're working on, I'll go yeah. over here. Right. And so that is a real issue. And the other part, for any of you who've never, has everyone had a chance to ever see what the dark web really is? is if oh, anyone, so scary. <laughs> it, it, you know, if you haven't, in, in serious, it, you know, um, we, we, in fact, just opened up something called the Cyber Range. I think mm. it is the only real, the real one of its kind, uh, first of its kind, a Cyber Range. And it, it's, of course, it's got all these, um, I don't even know what to, how, to, how to describe how it is uh, hermetically sealed. But it, in there is the dark web. And um, when we take clients in to see it to say, you realize what this is, and you'll go. To, you can buy anything for anything, mm -hmm. and it is very organized, extremely professional. It is. It is hierarchies. It is. <clears throat> there are you know uh, organizations perfectly set up, uh, service level agreements on anything you need to get. Right? I can guarantee this credit card will work five times before it doesn't work, and you name it. So it is. It is worth if you don't understand it to see it. It just gives you a tiny glimpse, and that's yeah. that's even just the that's commercial true. side of the dark web not even some of the worst side mm -hmm. of what is what you're up against. And I think if you do that, you would understand why this is the answer to this is around analytics in your company. That's correct, yeah. More than anything. Yeah. And it's just amazing, you know, the, and this is the perfect example in cybersecurity where you augment the capabilities of the human being. The machine learning and all the, you know, cognitive analysis and so on allows uh, you know, someone that's a cyber expert sitting there, um, it increases their productivity. It allows them to be more effective and productive. Um, and especially, you know, as you move forward into, 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 you know, sort of even these days, uh, but even, you know, five years out, you know, there is a challenge 
with respect to finding the right skill sets. Oh, that's right? a big problem. It's a big problem. You have to do right? this for that reason and, alone. And so therefore, you know, the ability to augment uh, the productivity of the existing workforce that one might have and to be able to increase their productivity uh, is a big I think the problem. estimate for open security jobs is a million. It's just a huge. Yeah, it's, it's a just big amazing. number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that's where I think, uh, you know, machine learning and cognitive computing uh, augmenting existing technologies and augmenting, uh, you know, uh, the human that's sitting there making decisions and so on. It's just, just a huge, huge uh, opportunity uh, for cost savings as well as achieving, you know, the job that needs to get done. I know he's got a lot of pages left in front of him, okay? So yeah. I don't know, I'm not sure where this is going. All right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you, Ginny, you've been involved, you know, at IBM and you've seen many, many phases uh, of uh, technologies and innovations that have happened over the years and, you know, how companies uh, and societies get transformed um, uh, and businesses have to transform. Uh, and, you know, obviously over the years, IBM has done a great job. And so talk a little bit about, uh, you know, as you look into the future, uh, transformation of businesses, uh, whether it's, you know, customers or even transforming you know, what IBM is doing. What are some of the things that you see happening? Well, you've learned a lot too, right? I have so, too, yeah. Yeah, so we should compare. Actually, I've, um, I've been with Promoted another time and I want him to share, I'll, I'll answer, but I, I want him to share too. Uh, I found fascinating list, a list of things he said about which kind of companies make it and don't make it. I don't know if you remember that conversation. Well, you have time while I talk, while you can <laughs> okay. think about it then. So, uh, um, so, so back to, what, what would, I guess, lessons learned or yeah, lessons observations learned maybe? Um, because I guess one, sometimes people say to me, well, what would you, write, what would you advise like a, a, a young company? Or, uh, and I, and I've, I've sat there and thought sometimes, and I think we would all probably say, yeah, might be some of the same things I would say about myself. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't matter. And um, so I look, we're now 105 years old. So right. anybody with, in, with companies in that circa, that era, anybody in the room? Okay, that would make me. All right, a, <laughs> it, they're probably the IBMers raising their hand. Okay, so, um, so, so okay, we're 105. And the one, you do have time, and I have had time to reflect about this, and as we've led this, in, been leading, and in the middle of this transformation we're in now, and at 105, in tech, because I remember when I started in tech, the competitors were, Burroughs, Unisys, NCR, um, I guess data it was, general, data yeah, general. <laughs> uh, Honeywell. Yeah. Now Honeywell's around, but not in this you That's know right. part yeah. of the uh, industry Deck. anymore. Deck, Deck Wang. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's just three of us that remember this. So, <laughs> and they're gone. And so, but my only point, and humbly on it, is um, there's a different set of lessons to transcend multiple eras because there are other companies that you can make it through one or two, um, but there's something else about four, five, and six, you know? And as I've thought back, and as a team, we have thought back about, you know, what about it in IBM? What are the lessons learned that you make it through these? That's right. Um, and you lead some of them, others you go through, you know, they're different, but we, I think, can stand here and say now we're the only one that has made it through multiple eras mm -hmm. of technology. <coughs> and. There are a couple things that I, almost weekly, I'll always bring to back to my mind. And one is this idea that know what must endure and what must change. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of it because people will say to me, well, what is IBM now? What is it? You know, I know you had PCs, that was a long time ago, and now, but what are you? And to me, the thing that stayed constant is, look, what we are is solutions to society and business, the most challenging issues. That's correct. How we did it has changed, mm -hmm. but that, that one thing stayed, con stayed constant. And that idea of not defining yourself as a product, even though we've talked a lot about Watson, but if we come back in 25 years, it'll be something else that, that will add to that. And this lesson of change endure and don't define yourself as a product. If you define yourself as a solution, it frees you up to do other things. Mm -hmm. The other. I think peace would be, and I, and I know this is hard, don't protect your past. Mm -hmm. And I think back, even in my tenure, um, we've divested of 
over $8 billion of businesses, done 50 acquisitions, spent, you know, on average, 6% of all our revenues in, in uh, R&D every year. And so that idea that you have to let go of some things is a hard thing, but it, if you don't, then you'll ride them down, right? And so, and, and then you can't change, it's too late. So this idea of don't protect your past, um, how, but even to a young company, right? And this is changing fast now, right? Um, would be my second lesson learned. And my third is one I have actually talked a lot about, which, um, and I think it's true, and it's an interesting at this point in time, I think it's true for people, it's true for companies, and it's true for countries, which is this thought that growth and comfort, they never coexist. That's so right. you have to get pretty comfortable with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. to have to live through these pieces. Change is always threatening. <laughs> it is, and, and I think, I mean, I, I felt like I learned it young, and, and if you, if, even if you shut your eyes, if, assuming they're not already shut, but if uh, <laughs> you shut your eyes and you think about um, when in life did you learn the most, right, is probably a time you were at risk for something yeah. that, that you, you were put at risk, and you'd say, yeah, that is when I did. And so I think companies and people have to get used to that feeling of being really uncomfortable. And it's, it's like, it's a very, um, to me, it's a very sort of almost soothing feeling to know that when you're really, really nervous about something, you're really learning something at That's that right. time, you know? Yeah. And so it's a channeling of that energy for both a company, a country, a person. Um, and those would be, to me, the sort of enduring lessons mm -hmm. that, uh, that, and again, um, we're still, we're still working, we're still moving through things. And so, but firmly, firmly now, this era of now us being a cognitive solution and cloud platform company is here. Very true. And we're seeing that, you know, we've seen that, you know, having funded a lot of companies, companies that get too comfortable with their status quo and don't want change because it's threatening, don't last. It's a, it's, yeah. it's, Sometimes it sneaks up on you, yeah, right? So yeah. you have to... And I think the other thing we're seeing in the marketplace today is that the rate of innovation is a lot faster than it used to be. Oh, there's without a doubt. And that's so true. therefore, the life cycle of products is a lot sh shorter than it used to be. It used to be 10 years. You know, you could design something and, you know, you could keep selling that product for 10 years. But now the pace of innovation is so high and so fast. Well, that's why I think it puts things a, get obsoleted a lot faster. You know, people use it sort of <laughs> as a, a buzzword, agile. But yeah. we've spent a lot of time because of this issue. That's right. You, any of us, I think, that run businesses, you've got to rethink about how you do work because that innovation cycle that is so fast, yeah. it, it can't be just for a little company. That's got to be for a big company too. Yeah. And so this idea that you co-locate people, minimum viable product, that you have multidisciplinary teams, that that, you know, and you sure. can do that in a big firm yeah. as well. I know we've, we've, I probably, I think we as a team have got about a billion dollars of real estate projects going on. You've got to wow. reconfigure workspaces. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, bring different skills together. And so we're probably one of the largest agile developments uh, in the world. That's I would great. Think. Okay, so I think it's time to open it up for some uh, questions. So from the audience here. My healthcare guy, I yeah. think. So uh, any yeah, okay, right there. We've got a mic back there, someone. Oh, yeah, there we go. I hope he was agreeing with me. I can't see him from yeah, here, right. okay? okay? So I might be in trouble. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as an IBMer, I, you know, really fascinated by this vision. But at the same time, I'm really scared. And I'll tell you why I'm scared. I'm not even scared about job 15 years from now or something. I'm more scared that at some point, AI or cognitive technology will try to conquer the world. Yeah. So and the question okay. is, what are we doing already now in security to prevent this kind of development? Yeah. I, this, is an, this is to me a um, couple a way to answer this. Uh, there's a misconception about this topic. First off, for, for AI, so I'm going to answer from two ways. Uh, I told you the goal. The goal is man and machine. So first it starts with the approach you take to oh, it. Yeah. But the second is these, the technologies for self-learning at massive scale like that, those do not exist today. And so the state of the art, you have to still, these are taught, these machines are taught, machines, I use that word loosely, these, these services, they're taught. So this is between man and, and these systems, these are statistical algorithms that you teach. So this isn't something that self-learns in 
does away with you. That isn't it. These are taught. Now, the second part of this whole thing, though, is back to my comments about the business model for data uh, and that it is important that you know you own your data and the IP from that. I think that's an important point because versus concentrating all data and all IP in two or three places in the world. That is not the world I would like to live in. I would like in a world of diversity of IP and who owns it and what happens. And mm. so I think that kind of a business model actually helps that issue as well. So. Great. Any other question? Over. Over. Okay, right there. Okay, there we go. I couldn't hear it. I'm sorry. Uh, what do you think about uh, Ray Kurzweil's uh, neocortex model and uh, mimicking that in silicon so you can actually in infuse cognition, not only cognition, but also consciousness eventually? Well, again, I, I think this point about you know, that you can mimic. We do a lot of work. In fact, actually, our head of research, well, all of it, John is here, on uh, brain-inspired <laughs> computing, right? And so we, and for many good reasons, by the way, to do things like um, perception and your ability to uh, have much safer roadways, all sorts of things that are around there. So I think these technologies, any one individual but if you try to then put together what man does in all of its pieces, we are not to that point. And, and it won't be for very far foreseeable future. So I think a lot, these are, let me bookend the, the different point, because I'm not just saying don't pay great attention to these things. I actually think there are issues of ethics that have to be paid attention to. And we are part of and we formed the AI partnership with, uh, with Google, with Facebook, uh, with others that is to say, look, you've got to take seriously some of the issues that come with the ethical side of AI. And in this case, not that you would have read, there was a very good paper, I think, actually, the um, White House did on, it was the Office of Science and Technology, uh, that frames what these kinds of issues are and what kind of both public debate and policies are required to have these technologies really do what we started with, which was mm -hmm. bring great good to society in, in that trade-off. So I think, don't, I don't mean to short count it, I think there's some issues about where the technologies are today and for the foreseeable future, but I also think we should then pay attention to these. Yeah. These, these are really valuable questions. All right, one more question. Right there. Oh. Get the mic, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Alex, CEO of a company called Data Novo. For the 21st year, IBM has gotten more patents than any other companies in the world. Do you envision dedicating some of those patented technologies, much like what Elon Musk has done with Tesla's patents? Do I envision dedicating some of those patented technologies to the public? Much, oh. much like the way <clears throat> Oh, we well. have. We have. We have been many times in our uh, lifetime here, we have dedicated these and put them in open source as an example. Uh, that's happened many times in our history. So these have not all been kept with us. There, <coughs> well, I can't even remember what percentage of them have, that's been done with, but many, many different times. In fact, it gave a big rise to the open source community, uh, what we dedicated and put out there. So, um, and I assume, and we will continue, I don't assume, we will continue to do. Doing that. So we do both. Yeah. And, and I think that's how many people who have, uh, not, maybe not many, but uh, intellectual property look at both sides of that, right? Yeah. Good, okay, so I think uh, we're gonna have to uh, close here because I think our time is running out. So, Karen, if you would come up. Let me just make one quick comment here, uh, give you a bunch of capital perspective and you know all the debates that have been going on about jobs and so on. Uh, this is the way I see it. You know, Let's just use a very simple example, call centers. Uh, a lot of call center jobs, as you know, have been outsourced to different parts of the world. Look at, and the reason for that is that uh, uh, you can get that job done for uh, one third the cost and so on and so forth. So now take a look at a call center individual here in the US. And if we augment that call center person with machine intelligence and cognitive computing and make that person two to three times more productive than he was on his own before he or she, that job can stay here and the money gets spent in the local GDP. And I think that's what we have to think about. Cognitive computing 
which is machine intelligence empowering, augmenting existing human beings and increasing their productivity will lead to tremendous amount of benefit for the country. So that's the way I look at cognitive computing in the future, whether it's call centers, whether it's other kinds of jobs, but I think it'll make a big difference. Anyway, you want to come up, Karen? <clears throat> Good. I'd like to so thank we... our speakers very yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you for more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.